For tape, CDs, DVDs, to our publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, write P.O. Box 21516, Hot Springs, Arkansas, Zip 71903. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. This is the 2011 Memorial Day Teaching and Deliverance Camp Meeting being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Camp in Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas. Friday evening, the 27th, 2011. Bo Fisher is the speaker of the service teaching on The Lord is With You. I tell folks in our church that, um, you know, you have the great commandment, which is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? That's the great commandment. And the great commission is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in the same context, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, that sort of thing. So theoretically, a balanced Christian life would be about half worship, uh, serving, loving your neighbor, studying, and the other half, evangelistic outreach or praying for the sick or ministering in various ways to other people, especially outside of the church. But anyway, that's just something that if you feel out of balance in that area, ask the Lord and he'll help you to come into balance, right? You don't have to strive with all that. Well, praise God. Uh, I just wanted to ask if uh, folks feel very clear on the idea of a, a spirit, how a spirit operates a spirit. One, there are, are a, a, there are a number of ways to answer this question. But what I want to tell you tonight is that one of the best ways to conceptualize the way that an evil spirit works is a mood, right? A mood or an attitude. To me, those three words are kind of interchangeable: spirit and mood and attitude. So that may help you because if you're like me, you go through different times in your the course of your day or in the course of your week where you may, you know, there's ups and downs. You may feel a, a mood. It could be a mood of sexual lust. It could be a mood of just kind of discouragement, depression, heaviness. It could be a mood of just feeling kind of tired and draggy and a variety of other things that we could paint. A mood of irritability, you know, things. a mood of just kind of being touchy or or, or cantankerous or contentious, things of that nature. You know, surely y'all that are married have noticed that kind of dynamic. Sometimes it just seems to be easier to get into a fight than other days, huh? It just seems almost predestined. <laughs> and it's helpful to recognize, it's, it's helpful. One of the nice things about going through a significant amount of deliverance and getting a degree of peace and stability in your life and fruits of the Spirit is that you've kind of got a, sort of a baseline, a reference point. And so that it helps you if you're too far off of that reference point in one way or another, feeling especially kind of heavy or draggy or listless or passive or touchy or whatever it might be, then it, it can help you to go, hmm, maybe there is an evil spirit operating here. And so that you can do spiritual warfare, do self-deliverance, or, or worship the Lord and, you know, take it up to a few thousand feet higher in elevation so that you're not subject to that kind of stuff. Does that make sense? Maybe that'll help you. Well, praise God. That's not in the sermon. Okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would come here tonight. I pray that you would uh, teach and minister to the people through me. Use my lips and my uh, throat and tongue. In Jesus' name, I pray that you would guide the teaching and that you'd minister to the people afterwards as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you all turn in your Bibles to the book of Judges, chapter 6. Judges 6, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. And I'm going to start reading at verse 1. The people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord gave them into the hand of Midian. That was a nearby nation. Seven years, and the hand of Midian overpowered Israel. And because of Midian, the people of Israel made for themselves the dens that are in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds 
For whenever the Israelites planted crops, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. They would encamp against them and devour the produce of the land as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance in Israel and no sheep or ox or donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents. They would come like locusts in number. Both they and their camels could not be counted so that they laid waste to the land as they came in. And Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the people of Israel cried out for help to the Lord. Here, in this story, as we've set it up, God's people are suffering greatly at the hands of their enemies, at the hands of foreign nations. You could look at that and, 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 and uh, symbolically as at the hands of demons. But the point is that they're oppressed and spoiled. And they're better off than they were in slavery in Egypt a couple of hundred years earlier. But it's still far from the abundant life. You know, far from the, the promise of the promised land or the expectation of the promised land. Now, turn to uh, verse 11 of the same chapter. Now, the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abiezrite while his son Gideon was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. And Gideon said to him, Please, sir, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and has given us into the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Do not I send you. And he said to him, Please, Lord, how can I save Israel? Behold, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, But I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. You know, I said last night that your main problem in life is not knowing what you already have, not knowing who and what you already are, and not knowing what has already been done for you. Gideon is here beating wheat in a wine press. Now, most of us here in this room neither beat wheat nor tread grapes in a wine press. Okay, <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ever beaten wheat. Okay, I haven't either. Okay, How about treading wine in a wine press? Not that you remember. Huh? Okay. <laughs> anyway. You don't beat wheat in a wine press. As far as I understand, the way that you, you beat wheat in such a way that you, you, it's, you th- you're beating it is threshing it, and you're doing it on uh, like on a towel or a big sheet or something like that, so that then you can uh, kind of toss it up in the wind, and the, the chaff, the part that you don't want to eat, blows away in the wind. So it's actually the kind of thing that you do sort of out in the open. But they weren't doing it out in the open out of fear of these marauding bands and invading armies because it would just be stolen. So he's down in the wine press doing in that place what he's not supposed to be doing. You know, he's supposed to be doing something else in the wine press and he's hiding at that. So this is a a picture of things not the way that they should be. But God shows up and tells him three things about his situation that he did not know. Number one, he tells him that God is with Gideon. And number two, he tells him that Gideon is a mighty man of valor. And number three, he tells him that because of these things, Gideon will strike the Midianites as one man. In other words, he will, he will beat them down and overcome them. Now, I want to ask you, what did Gideon have to do for these things to happen and take place at this point? Well, he had, first of all, he had to believe the Lord or the angel of the Lord, and then he had to show up. He had to believe and he had to show up. And he had to trust the word of the Lord and act consistently with it and not behave in ways that were patently contrary to what God had said. He couldn't be like Jonah, who when Jonah told him that he was going to do a certain thing and to go and do a certain thing went totally the other direction. Okay, but if he just basically cooperated with what God said was the plan that God had put in place, the, he could trust that these things would happen. All these good things would happen. Keep, well, we're, you don't need to keep your finger there. We're not going back to Judges. Turn to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Gideon and his attitude and his response are actually mentioned here in a very brief way in Hebrews 11, verse 32. This is the... Famous Hall of Faith chapter where all the 
folks who moved in special faith, many of the folks who moved in special faith are noted. Hebrews 11.32, And what more shall I say, the writer says, For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Many of these things could be applied to Gideon. Okay? Through faith, he... I would say that he was made strong out of weakness, right? I would say that he became mighty in war. And he would certainly put foreign armies to flight. But all of these things, I would note to you, are from God. They're from God. They're by God. And they're for God. And we sort of get to participate. You know, so like if you had a kid and you brought him along with you on the trip, you know, you might let him, you know, hold, you know, hold the steering wheel, you know, or whatever you're doing. And, and in a sense, he's doing it, but there's a sense in which you're doing it too. You're sort of setting things up and letting him hold the stick. Like here's a good example. My dad is a, is a pilot, a private airline, uh, not an airline pilot, but a private pilot. He flies sailplanes and he flies uh, you know, prop planes, and many times I've flown with him, and he'll say in the middle of flight, would you like to take the stick, okay? And so there's a sense in which I'm flying the airplane, okay, well, there's not really anything to hit, you know, <laughs> 3,500 feet, you know, <laughs> you're pretty safe. So, I'm, I mean, he's flying the airplane in, in one sense, but I'm flying the airplane just as well, too, you know, I mean, I'm getting the sensation of it and the experience of it. I could make execute some simple turns or stall it, purposely stall it if I wanted to or things like that to learn to fly. In fact, he would say, you know, why don't you make a turn? You know, why don't you point the nose down? Why don't you stall it in the sailplane? That's where you pull up on the stick and you come to the point where you're, you're not flying anymore because, and, and then you fall and, you know, you nose dive. It's, it's not dangerous at 3,500 feet. <laughs> you just recover. And, and so you get the experience of what that's like. I'm essentially learning to fly. I'm flying, but I'm learning to fly, but I can't fly, but I am flying. You, you kind of get the point of all that? Well, sort of uh, tying this in with last night, at the end of Ephesians chapter 1, we saw last night that Paul tells them how he prays for them, how he prays for the church there in Ephesus. That essentially, that they would know what they already have and who and what they already are and what has already been done for them. And the emphasis at the very end of chapter 1 in Ephesians is dominion. The dominion of Christ. Christ is at the right hand of God, right? The right hand speaks of power. Most of us are right-handed. That's what we... When you're talking about the right hand, you're talking about the seat of power and authority. <clears throat> he is above, he's not just above all else. He's called far above all else. And not just now, now and forever. So the emphasis is sort of superlative and, and uh, great magnitude and, and of dominion. And we are in him. And in chapter 2, it's going to talk a little bit about our share in that, about training to reign, so to speak, as we're in him as he reigns from the throne. And then chapter 3 continues with the same general theme. And then there's a, a great shift going into chapter 4 and 5 and the beginning of chapter 6, where it begins to talk about some of our responsibilities, some of the behavioral responsibilities that we have to live up to that high calling. Amen? Well, let's uh, go over to Ephesians chapter 2. Okay, Ephesians 2, and let's look at verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Now, the Bible in basic English renders it this way. You were dead through your wrongdoing and sins. They, those things, your wrongdoing and sins, are what caused the state of death that you were in. Uh, you were dead, and the reason you were dead because, was because of the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. You were dead. But the tense, however, is very precious. Because just as it said in 
Ephesians 1, verse 3, we read it last night, that God has, not will, but already has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. And how we also read in verse 4 of that same chapter that God chose us, not will choose us, but has already chosen us in Christ before the foundation of the world. And in verse 11 of the same chapter, we read how in Christ we have, not will get one day, but already have obtained an inheritance. In chapter 2, verse 1, we read that we were dead, but are not anymore. It's okay to shout hallelujah. Okay? I told them last night, I said, oh, every week I get to preach to blank, unstaring faces in my own, blank, staring faces in my own church. So it's a privilege to get to have some new blank, staring faces to preach. That's a joke. Reba's, Reba is a member of our church, and she's not a blank, staring face. <laughs> okay, look at, uh, continuing on in verse 2, in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience. The course of this world is trespasses and sins. You know, I took a class called the human situation. I was, at, I was, I went to the University of Houston when I was a freshman. Uh, I was in the honors program, and if you were in the honors program as a freshman, you took a class. It was called a multidisciplinary class, and it was team taught by professors from various departments. There was a history professor, there was a philosophy professor, there was an English professor, there was a, you know, one or two other various discipline professors like that, social sciences, and they. It was team taught. It was basically an English class in the sense that we would read. And, and write papers and things like that. But it was also trying to sort of create a whole sense of, it was called the human situation. The human situation. And what's astounding, I was not a Christian at the time. I was right about to be a Christian. We even read the book of Job. And we read several of the minor prophets, along with, you know, Greek plays and Shakespeare and all the things that you would think you would read in a in a multidisciplinary college class about the human situation. But it, looking back on it, essentially, the, the sort of the, the, the theme of the human situation was tragedy. <laughs> was tragedy. Was sin. Was the tremendous potential for greatness that is always somehow just fallen short of. Isn't that an amazing thing? That people, most of those were not even Christian. I think one of the professors may have been a Christian. Most of those folks were not even Christian. And, they're, and when you look at Greek tragedy, and when you look at ancient history, and when you look at uh, more modern uh, philosophers and, and playwrights and authors and things like that, and you put together all of these things, what you get is such possibility and such a waste such a such a almost such an almost but because of sin it's essentially sin in fact we even learned the word that in greek for greek is sin in in uh, in in place it's i probably don't say it right cuz hamartia does that sound familiar to you h a m a r t i a however you pronounce that and it basically means a virtue in excess. It basically means sin. Well, anyway, I'm not sure how I got off on that. But, oh, I was saying that the course of this world, the experience of the whole world, is essentially trespasses and sins, right? Of loving a woman, but one day cheating on her, right? Or of loving your children so much, but one day just losing it and beating the heck out of them, you know, or slapping them or something like that. Or of being so much wanting to provide for your family and, and stuff like that and just one day driving off into the sunset and leaving them, you know, or telling your boss to take a hike and losing that good job and your, your fortunes totally change from there on out. Things that It's just a, a, a whole, it's, you could travel around the world to the other side of the world and if you had a conversation of enough depth with someone you would be able to uncover this sense of sin. Trespasses and sin. It is the lot of unredeemed humanity because of a spirit in the air that works on the sons of disobedience. Another Bible translation calls that the children of unbelief. Now, I always thought, 
I don't know if y'all are like me. I always thought when I read this, sons of disobedience, that that was very likely talking about disobedient Christians. Just because of the way that was written, sons of disobedience. I thought that meant like Christians that were backslidden or disobedient or something like that. But really the context does not support that because it goes on to say, among whom we all once lived. Or in other words, we were all once like that. Well, we weren't all once backslidden Christians. That doesn't make sense. So just logically, I've come to the conclusion that that just means people that don't obey God, whether they're Christian or not. The sons of disobedience, just people that are not obeying God. But understanding about this spirit in the air that works on the sons of disobedience, hopefully will help you to have mercy on people. You know, Gene said today, uh, you know, we shouldn't get offended that sinners sin. You shouldn't be surprised that sinners sin. And, and we should have mercy. They're under the influence of a powerful evil spirit and need light. Keep your finger here in Ephesians 2, but turn over to Second Corinthians chapter 4 for a second. As I said last night, sometimes when we turn, I may go ahead and start reading before you get there, just for time's sake. Second Corinthians 4, and look at verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world... Wouldn't you think that that is that same, a reference to that same spirit that is now at prince of the power of the air, spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience? In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So, have mercy, preach the gospel, pray for them, love them, be persistent, be patient, and remember they're dead. You don't get mad at dead people. Okay, back in Ephesians 2, we're going to read verse 3. Among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Another verse, it says, We obeyed the promptings of our own instincts and notions. Another one says, In the past you were dead because you sinned and fought against God. You followed the ways of this world and obeyed the devil. He rules the world, and his spirit has power over everyone who doesn't obey God. Once, we were also ruled by the selfish desires of our bodies and minds. We had made God angry, and we were going to be punished like everyone else. This, this phrase right here, by nature, children of wrath, that is the first of many contrasts that you see in the book of Ephesians. I mentioned last night to the folks that since February, I've read the book of Ephesians 73 times in about 25 or 30 different uh, Bible translations. I guess that's why Brother Richard was talking about getting out several Bible translations. It was just helpful to me. That was what I felt like I needed to do. You don't have to read the Bible in a bunch of different translations. But, you know, it's, I was thinking, you know, why would you do that? Well, it's because you could, you could stand up here and, and we could go in the room and I wouldn't do it publicly. But if y'all were each to go off and write a little, you know, on an index card, write a brief dis- physical description of the man standing up there behind the pulpit, okay? Well, we might get, there's a fat guy wearing a pink shirt, okay? He's a fat guy wearing a pink shirt. Or you might say, there's a portly gentleman wearing a pink shirt, right? Or you might say, there's a guy in a pink shirt, he's got a little bit overweight. Or you might say, uh, there's a guy up there in a pink shirt who needs to eat less and exercise more. Or however, <laughs> however you want to say that, the point is, is every single one of those is a different way of describing that. And every one of those things gives a different shade of meaning. Some of them might have a scornful attitude to them. Some of them might be couched in uh, yourself being overweight and, and you're writing it out with much mercy. You know, <laughs> But the point is, is that by reading all those, if you read 40 different index cards like that, you'd begin to really good, get a good feel for what the guy up there looked like, even if you'd never seen him, right? Well, that was kind of the philosophy behind reading this <clears throat> uh, epistle in so many different versions. But this by nature, children of wrath is the first of many contrasts that you see all the way through the book of Ephesians. In chapter 1, verse 5, uh, he says it, Paul says it, uh, God predestined us for adoption as sons. Predestined us for adoptions as sons. But that's contrasted to sons of disobedience. You have sons of God, 
You have sons of disobedience. You have children of God, objects of His love, and you, as opposed to children of wrath, objects of His wrath. Now, here in verse 3, among whom we all once lived and were by nature children of wrath. Again, the tense in that verse is very much blessed because it says you were by nature the children of wrath. You were dead, but not anymore. You were by nature a child of wrath, but not anymore. If you're born again, you're a new creation. You have a new nature. Because of this next phrase, verse 4, but God. Isn't that, I like that phrase, but God. But God. (laughs) Here's what we did. (laughs) Here's what we were. Here's what we made of our lives. Here's where we were going, but God. God did this and made us thus. Let me read these verses. But God, being rich in mercy... Because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised us up with Him and seated us with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Again, we were dead. We walked in sins. We followed the devil like the rest of mankind, carrying out our desires, but not anymore because of that but God. Because of the but God, He made us alive. He gave us completely a once-for-all new nature, and He raised us up on high. You're not really going to become something different, as if, you had to pray for God to change you into something else. The tone of the New Testament, which is the New Covenant, is to recognize and understand and come into the fullness of what you already are, like a baby growing up, growing up into Him in whose image you're made. Turn with me, keep your finger here in Ephesians 2, but let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. As I said last night, If I say things that are in the Scriptures, take them, receive them, pray about them, incorporate them in your Christian walk. If I say things that are not scripturally supported, you can smile at me, be gracious, ignore me. (laughs) But I trust this will minister to you. Look at Genesis 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. You see that? Look at verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Look at verse 28. And God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion. Now, in Luke chapter 3, Adam is called the son of God. Y'all remember that? The genealogy of Jesus. He goes all the way back to Adam and calls him the son of God. Now, turn over to, where is it? Genesis chapter 5. Look at verse 3. When Adam had lived, 5 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he fathered a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. So, again, in Luke 3, Adam is called the Son of God. And we see that Seth is fathered in the likeness of Adam. So what is the son of the Son of God? What what do you call the son of the Son of God? It would be the grandson of God. But there's a problem because something has happened between Genesis 1 and Genesis 5. And that is that sin has entered the human race. Adam is now a sinner. So Seth is the son of a son of disobedience. That doesn't sound as good, does it? So, because of that problem, and Seth's son the same way, and Seth's son's son's the same way, God dealt with the sin issue in Christ. That's what he did. He did it He did it on his own initiative. 
Right? No one convinced him to do it. No one talked him into it. No one prayed him into doing it. He just did it because his original plan was interrupted. And so he fixed the interruption through Christ. Now, we, have this, we, had, we had this progression of God, Adam, Seth. Now we have a different progression. And it goes like this. God, second Adam. Who's that? Or the last Adam is called God, last Adam, believer. Now, what do you call a son or a brother of a son of God? What do you call a brother of a son of God? That's another son of God. Exactly. Y'all are a good study. Okay. Y'all ever read The Normal Christian Life by Watchman Nee? That's an excellent book to explain these things about what God has done for us in Christ. If you take sin out of the equation, now the believer is once again truly a son of God, a, a brother of Christ. Okay? Now, it says, you can turn back to Ephesians 2. It says in the New English Bible, the way that it describes being in Christ is it describes it as being in union with Christ. In union with Christ. Like we're one with Christ. And that makes sense because it says, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit, right? There's a union there. And in, in making a case against sexual immorality, Paul says, You're members of Christ. Don't take your members and don't take the members of Christ and join them to a prostitute. The, the, the issue of sexual immorality, notwithstanding, the point that he's trying to make is, I mean, another point that can be inferred from the whole thing is that we're, we're members of Christ. We're one with Christ. We're a part of the body of Christ. There's not any separation between us and Him. We are joined with Him forever. And with Christ Jesus, God raised us up and enthroned us with Him in the heavenly realms so that He might display in the ages to come how immense are the resources of His grace and how great His kindness to us in Christ Jesus. I wrote here in my notes, don't limit His grace, for it is immense, or His kindness, for it is great. Another version renders it this way, so that we came back from death with Him and are seated with Him in the heavens in Christ. You know, think of it this way. <clears throat> Christ Jesus came to the earth. He came body and soul, right? And died. He died body and soul. Some people he'd say he died spiritually in spirit. I don't personally believe that. I think that a stronger case can be made against that than can be made for that. A, a, we, a case could be made for that. I think a stronger case can be made against that rather than for that. So think of it this way. Christ came to earth. He died body and soul but not in spirit. Okay? Alright, now stay with me here. We, who were dead in spirit, were put into Christ. Now Christ is raised from the dead, body, soul, and spirit. Right? Body, soul, and spirit are what is at the right hand of God. All of it. His resurrection, body, and of course His soul and spirit. We, on the other hand, are raised in Him, spirit, right? We were dead, but now we're not. We were raised spirit and soul. The old man is dead. We're a new creature in Christ, but not our body. Our body has not been raised from the dead like Christ. That is the one thing that is yet to come. That's the thing for the future. Our mind is being renewed, our soul is being renewed, and our body will run one day be glorified and be like His body. Okay, enough about that. Let's go to verse 8. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Another version says, Because by grace you have salvation through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is given by God. Another version says, Not a reward for work done, or not by works, so that no man may take glory to himself. I think that these are some of the sweetest words in the Bible. Tell me if you agree with me. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. 
Kevin, what does your own doing do? Historically, what is the basic testimony of when, when Kevin has his own doing? What is the fruit of that? <laughs> I'm so very grateful that it is not of my own doing. It is the gift of God. In fact, why don't you just close your eyes. Close your eyes right now. Listen to me. These things that we've been talking about, being in Christ, made holy, blameless, unreproachable in His sight, being raised from the dead to sit in heavenly places with Christ at the throne of God, these things, all these things we've been talking about, this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. That's good news, huh? That's what we call good news. Okay, look at verse 10. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. His workmanship. It's like we are His good work. The believer, the individual believer and the corporate body of believers, we are His good works, and now we are to go and do good works. And essentially it's God doing the good works through us, so He's still continuing His good works. He's just doing it with our hands and mouths and arms now. Does that make sense? God prepared the works and implied in that is that we go and walk in and do the good works. If He's prepared them, then it's, it's, uh, it's a shame. It's scandalous. It's uh, unnecessary and it is uh, disadvantageous for us not to do them. It's like leaving things on the table. Like we were talking about in the video game analogy last night. Maybe we have more video game players in the room tonight. You know, where you're, it's like you're in a, it, it, we're in a video game and you're going along, and and part of the video game, not the main part of it, but part of the side parts of it, are to go and, you know, like, pick up little things, or ring the bell, or, you know, whatever it is, and, and you know, there'll be a little ding, and a flash of light, and you get 300 points. I'm sorry, y'all are, y'all are just more, better Bible readers. I don't play a lot of video games. <laughs> But the point being, it's like those are the those are the the credits. Those are the things you're accumulating. Those are the things that you're going to be rewarded on in life. It's not how well you knew the Bible. It's the good works that you do in His name, right? It talks about in in the end part of Revelation. It talks about uh, being clothed with. Um, doesn't it talk about the bride being, coming down from heaven? Anyway, somewhere in there, there's something about the fine linen, which are the righteous deeds of the saints. I'm getting... Okay, well, you guys are going to make me look it up. I bought this Cruden's Concordance, and I'm going to do it right now. I'm going to prove that I can, under fire, on TV, on the Internet, linen. Hmm. I don't know about that. Okay. Well, I'm probably not going to be able to do it. But I can be stubborn. <laughs> so we'll see if I can do it. Give me just one second here. I'll speak in tongues. Yeah. Okay. Revela- Let's go over to it. Revelation what? 1914. You know how hard it was to find that Credence, Con- Credence Concordance in the leather like that. I had to look all over the internet for it, pay extra for it. And it was about... 19 verse 8, Revelation 19, 8. It was granted to her, talking about the bride of Christ, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. Those are the good works that God has prepared before us, before for us to walk in them. Now, we, if we choose not to walk in them, that is not what our, um, uh, our, our, whether or not we go to hell is based on. Okay, that's not what our, our our salvation, meaning our justification, is based on. But it's like you're leaving things on the table, right? It's like it, it, you, it, those are things that are essentially um, a part of your eternal reward that you 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 personally will enjoy for all eternity. I mean, it, it is to your benefit. It's like making investments in your own eternal retirement. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to find language that will be meaningful to you. 
Okay. Let me ask this, some of you that are maybe more gray-haired. Do you wish <laughs> that you had listened when someone had said to you when you were 18, gosh, you have an income if you just invested $100 a month in a mutual fund until you were 72? <laughs> Well, it's that way. If you just help the old lady across the street once a day, so to speak, you know, whatever it might be, witness to somebody, hand out a tract, pray for somebody at Walmart if they're in a wheelchair and something like that. You see somebody over there crying, go over and, you know, reach out to him, ask if you can pray for him, something like that. Those are the righteous deeds of the saints. Those are the good works. Those are the, the that is the spreading the savor of Christ throughout the world. We were given existence in Christ Jesus to do those very good works which God before made ready for us so that we could do them. In other words, God doesn't do things for no reason. It's not like he prepared all these good works just in case we feel like it. We may even have to make an intentional choice to apply ourselves to do them even if we don't feel like it at all. That's what obedience is. And that's your purpose in life now if you're born again. Okay, back to, thank you to the Bible scholars who found that in Revelation 19. Okay, Ephesians 2, and look at verse 11. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. You know, I think Paul makes a special point of describing circumcision in this way. Because this is a contrast. He says, circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Circumcision is a sign of an old covenant. But he's been talking about a new covenant. It's made in the flesh, but yet the whole tone, the whole theme of the New Testament is walking in the Spirit. And by hands, by human hands. But again, the whole theme of this book and what we've just been reading is about the acts of God and what God has done, not what humans have done. So this is a contrast. Circumcision made in the flesh by hands. Human righteousness. I wrote in my notes, how clumsy. How ignorant to trust in that. God circumcises our hearts in the spirit, invisibly, and in so doing destroys the old self and gives us a new nature. The difference is like that of between a brain surgeon of 30 years experience and your nine-year-old who's found a rusty machete in the garage, you know, and is out in the back, you know, hacking things with it. That's the difference between the new covenant and the old covenant. Continuing on in verse 11, your former condition. At one time you were. You see that again? No, that's not exactly what it says. Let's go on to verse 12. Remember that you were, at that time, separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I wrote here, that verse says that you were triply lost. You were triple lost. There are, there are three things here that he says, ways that you were lost. Number one is you were separated from Christ. Number two is that you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Cut off from any part in Israel's rights as a nation. And finally, strangers to the covenants of promise. The promise was not for you. Having no hope and without God in the world. That's like the summary of those three things. Separated from Christ plus alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, plus stranger to the covenant of promise, equals having no hope and without God in the world. You know, I can say that that was my testimony on August the 13th, 1988, as I leaned against the Eckerd Drug Store after cashing my last paycheck for the summer, ready to go back to college, drinking a orange Gatorade, trying to get my pounding head back together after a, a rough night out, the night before, when uh, Jerome Nelson came up to me and said, would you like to talk about God? Right? That was me. Without having no hope and without God in the world, when God sent Jerome to find me. And I left there different. The were became are. Right? But God... 
You were those things. You were separated from Christ. I was separated from Christ, but now I am united with Christ. I was alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Commonwealth, that's the same word like members of the UK commonwealth enjoy certain privileges, right? There are certain privileges that members of the UK commonwealth enjoy that that I don't enjoy as a member of another country and not a member of that commonwealth. But I enjoy now the commonwealth of Israel. And I was a stranger to the covenant of promise. They did not apply to me, but now they do because I've been put into Christ. I have a part in God's agreement with Israel and with those promises. Look at verse 14. No, verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, again, there's one of those buts. But. You were, but. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Amen. For He Himself is our peace. Who has made us both one and has broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Jews and Gentiles, he made them both one. Again, there's one of those contrasts in the book of Ephesians. Jews and Gentiles are contrasted together. The purpose of this, in making the two one, was not to make Jews out of Gentiles. Many people make that mistake. That is not the case. The purpose of God was not to make Gentiles into Jews, nor was it to make Jews into Gentiles. It was to make a new order, a new creature, a new creation. It's called a, uh, a one new man in a moment, we'll see. Something better. Sons of God, a kingdom of priests. Now look at verse 15. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. The Wycliffe Bible says, He voided the law of commandments by dooms. I love that. That's written in like the 1200s. <laughs> okay. uh, another version says, Having in his flesh put an end to that which made the division between us, even the law with its rules and orders. Another version says, Christ gave his own body to destroy the law of Moses with all its rules and commands. Now, I will not stand here in this of all pulpits, and especially not in this season, and expound on the role of the law in the life of a Christian. But I'll share with you, you get your pen out, just write down these Bible verses. I'll, I'll share with you the Bible verses that had, have helped me to form the conclusions that I have on the matter. Uh, Romans chapter 9, starting in verse 30 and going through chapter 10, 4. Uh, Romans 13, starting in verse 8 and continuing on for several verses. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3, the whole chapter. Uh, the book of Galatians, chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5. You know, I started a different Bible reading program at the beginning of this year. Uh, have you all ever read the one-year Bible? Stuff like that. I've read the one-year Bible several times. That's where you read the Bible through in one year. In fact, uh, Brother Tom, he, uh, he handed out a, a Through the Bible in One Year reading guide to some of the guys in our men's deliverance session today. That's really cool. Reading the Bible through in one year is a good... That's kind of a, a, a good pace. You know, if you, it's about three chapters a day. If you can keep on that and do that several years in a row, you'll really learn the Bible, especially if in teachings like this you'll take notes and write down the verses that the speakers refer to and then go back the next day and look them up. You'll learn them in your Bible. That's, that's how I learned the Bible. Anyway, now, but at the beginning of this year I started something different. What I decided that I wanted to do is to read the Bible in the order, is to read the New Testament in the order that it was written. Because I thought, not in, in, in the chronology of when the events happened, but when it was written, because I thought, what that will do is that will tell me what the apostles thought was the most important to get out there, you know, to, to get the information out to the new believers and the new disciples. You know, the very first book written in the New Testament was the book of Galatians to address this issue of what is the role of the law for the Christian. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse uh, 15. We just read that one. And then finally, uh, write down uh, this one. You can look it up later. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8. Now look at verse 17 here in Ephesians 2. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. That's another contrast in the book of Ephesians. This far off from God and near to God. Who is it that's far off from God? That's the Gentile is who he's talking about in this verse. That's a, those don't know anything about God. They may be worshiping spider gods or Venus or who knows what. Okay. And then who is who's the ones who are near? That's the Jew. That's the Jews. That's the ones that are the have the, the covenants and the promise and the prophets and the law and all this kinds of stuff. Why do they need peace preached to them? If they already have all these things. Because of the law. Because the law made them transgressors before God. Because no one kept it. That's its purpose. Is to show the inability of unredeemed man to keep the law like that. To stumble at it. That's what... You you don't turn to it now. You can look up at Romans 9, starting in verse 30. That's what that's all about. Going about to set up their own righteousness... They have missed the righteousness of God because they went about it in the flesh, not by faith. And they missed the because God has completely purposed that no man will except Jesus will ever make it to the end of that road and say, I did it all. The Apostle Paul, I mean, aside from being a murderer, (laughs) he said even before that, look, how do you not covet How do you not covet? Jesus came and he said, if you look at a woman to lust for in your heart, you're an adulterer. How can that law make someone righteous? No, it certainly can't. God had provided another way. Look at verse 18. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. Okay, Whether you are far off, whether you are near, near isn't near enough. You need to be in Him. You need to be able to go right through the veil into the Holy of Holies. Boldly access to the throne of grace. Look at verse 19. So then you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. You're no longer... You were a stranger and an alien. We already made that point. But that's over. And it's contrasted now with being fellow citizens with the saints. Who is that? I would guess that's the the righteous dead. Right? And those who are alive today, it's in the Apostles' Creed. We believe in the communion of saints. Okay? And members of the household of God. That, uh, that word fellow citizens in the Greek, it means native of the same town. Say, say, say this after me. I am a native of the same town as the saints, living and dead. Amen. I am a member of the household of God. Again, that's one of the many contrasts in Ephesians. Member and citizen versus stranger and alien. Now, I come from Pasadena, Texas. They're in the southeast Texas, which we have a very heavy immigrant population in our region. Okay, And many of them are illegal aliens, illegal immigrants. And then you have legal immigrants and resident aliens. And then you have citizens. I guarantee there is a very different way that a... Okay, let's just take the illegal alien out of it altogether, okay? That's uh, criminal. Now, let's just talk about someone who is here legally. Like I shared last night, Fernando and Erica are uh, visiting and involved with our church from Bolivia, and they are here legally. They have legal immigration papers and things like that. But I guarantee there is a different way that Fernando relates to, to our government, to our country, to the other people, and things like that, than the way that I do, right? I was born here. It's old hat. I know what my rights are. I've had my rights, you know, pounded into me from the time I'm born. I probably can't quote the Bill of Rights, but I can quote you three or four of them, you know. (laughs) And I know that they all apply to me. 
And I know that, you know, somebody darn sure better read me my Miranda rights if I'm arrested or, you know, all these kinds of things. I know what applies to me. I have certain privileges and rights by virtue of my birth. Okay, You have certain privileges and rights by virtue of the new birth. They're not rights to demand of God. They're rights to demand of the devil. That you insist that he, that he, as a lesser order of creation at this point in the kingdom of heaven, get his hands off of you, off of yours, off of everything in the name of Jesus. That's what deliverance is. Don't you have authority over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy? Well, how do you have that authority? That authority is something that has been, in, when Christ was on the earth, delegated, and then now that you have been raised from the dead in Christ, it's by virtue of your positional authority. Amen? So, theoretically, you should talk down to the devil. Right? If we're in Christ, and all, as we made the case last night, the bottommost part of the body of Christ would be the bottom of his feet. Right? That's the bottom, that's the lowest that you can get and still be in the bottom, in the body of Christ is the bottom of his feet. But the last verses of Ephesians 1 say, and God has put all things under Christ's feet. But you're in the body of Christ, so that means all things are under your feet. Okay? Especially as it relates to powers, principalities, rulers, dominions, thrones, whatever those heavenly realities are. The entire spirit world. Amen? Or as another brother put it one time, when you walk into any room, you are the highest order of being in the room. Okay? That doesn't mean you lord it. Certainly not lord it over fellow believers. You don't lord it over anybody. So that means you're there to serve. <laughs> right? You're there to serve the humans and you're there to cast out the demons. Amen? Praise God. You know, we started with a story about a man who was hiding and famished and frustrated because he didn't know what he already had and who he already who and what he already was and what had already been done for him and so i say uh, to you tonight that the lord is with you the lord is with you and you are a mighty man or woman of valor because of what god has done for you in christ regardless of how you feel and you will overcome the flesh, the world, and the devil and tread him underfoot. Amen? That's the truth. doesn't matter what you feel. doesn't even matter what your past experience has been. doesn't matter what book you read. This is the only book that matters as far as that goes. And that's what it says. So your experience will come up to the truth as you believe the truth and make choices consistent with the truth, then your experience, the way you feel and the things that you see happen in the future and stuff like that, will be consistent with what I've just said in the Word of God as you begin to make choices based on that truth. Is that clear? Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, what I'd like to do is I'd like to pray for anyone that has any type of uh, physical ailment, physical infirmity, sickness, uh, pain, hurting, uh, disease, uh, injury, whatever that might be. My experience has been that's probably everybody. <laughs> um, what, what I'd like to ask you to do is, if, that is uh, if you have a physical need of any kind, uh, what I'd like to do, let me read the Scripture here. The Scripture says in uh, James, is that all right? We have time for that? Okay. Uh, James chapter 5. Is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church. Okay, I would be included in that group. Norman and Dario Parish installed me as a, an elder of New Wine Christian Fellowship in uh, June of 2009. So that would be me. Okay, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. I actually happen to have some oil right here. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. And the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. So, if you... Uh, I'm going to put this gum in my mouth so I'll have nice fresh breath. You should appreciate that. It's a courtesy. I 
chew it into the camera for my stepmother, who'd be absolutely scandalized. She'd never let me chew gum as a... She'd really be horrified I was doing it on TV. <laughs> um, anyway, um, come on, don't be shy. If you're sick, hurting, whatever, come on up front. Gene, would you come on over here? And Richard, would you come on over here? I've asked these two folks to, to help me just in case. You just come stand over here, sweetheart. Okay. Y'all just line up in a, if you can line up in the aisle, would you mind? Just line up in the aisle. No, uh, up and down the aisle. So here, ladies first. She's first. You guys, y'all just push on, squeeze back just a little bit. Listen, if it's, if you're gonna be standing a long time and you get tired or something, feel free to just sit down in the chairs right there. I don't mean for you have to stand for a long time, but this is just for order's sake. Would you stand over here, Richard? Thank you. Okay. And if you need to leave, uh, be released with a blessing or to just try to be sensitive to the ministry going on up front here. If you carry on your conversations, maybe you can do it in a low tone or towards the back order. In the name of Jesus, Father, we thank you for the things you've done here tonight so far. We pray you continue the ministry all the way until everyone has gotten what they need. We pray for protection tonight and for a good night's sleep and for a, a, a good showing Tomorrow morning at morning prayer where the power of the Lord will be here to set us free in Jesus' name. Amen. Six o'clock tomorrow morning. Bless you. If you need prayer, we're going to pray for you, okay? But this is just for the folks that need to go. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com and lhbconline.com. There are hundreds of free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home.